Okay, okay, settle down, all y'all. Good morning, my name is Ron. I'm one of the pastors here this morning. And one of the things that I have really a privilege of doing this morning is something I'm looking forward to, which is our guest speaker for today. Uh, I wanna let you know that I met this guy when it was, must be 1998. I was five years old back then. <laughs> Uh, when I had much more hair, much less gray. Yes, it's so true. Um, but was able to work on staff with him at Santa Cruz Bible Church. And uh, he has been such a blessing to the church all over this county, over the hill and otherwise. God's used him in great, great ways and is continuing. We get the exciting privilege to have him share with us uh, a, a big task, really. I have gave him a really hard thing to do, which was to cover all of Samson's life. So that's going to be great, chapters 14 through 16. But I want us to give a warm welcome to Josh Fox. I want to pray for Josh this morning. Father, we just thank you for your word that speaks. It, it is powerful. It accomplishes what it's set out to do. Now use your servant, Lord, to touch our hearts. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this room to be the teacher. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks so much. Goodness. Thank you, Ron. Oh, can you give it, give it up for Ron? Come on. Ron and Shay, thanks, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, you get around a healthy church that's growing both deep and wide, and you go, you, you got to look around and go, who's leading this place? And uh, I just appreciate Ron and your leadership, and I know a lot of the guys and a lot of the girls in this place that are leading here. Uh, that's, that, that's what's making this place healthy is God moving in and through you. So, so thank you for doing that, for dedicating your lives to making this place awesome and seeking God. Well, I'm excited to be here. As Ron mentioned, my name's Josh, and uh, this is a little a picture of my family. I just also want to welcome those who are sitting outside and sitting in our overflow room, and also if you're joining us online, we are just grateful that you've come and are hanging out with us today. Just a little photo of my family to get to know us. Uh, this is my wife, Danielle, and our three sons, London, Rylan, and Sawyer. And our, our kids are actually involved in the youth ministry here with Ryan, so I'm just grateful for Ryan and his leadership as well. It's just been an awesome place here. And so, in fact, we live so close to the church, uh, most of the time we could just walk here. The last few weeks we've been coming, we just walked. So I'm like, this is, like, incredible. And so uh, really just grateful for this place. That's my family. Now, about 18 years ago, my wife actually lost uh, one of the most expensive things I had ever purchased in my life. It was her wedding ring. So my wife, uh, among many things, is a painter, and when she would paint, she would take her wedding rings off and put them by the bedside table, and then after she was done, she would come out, and she'd grab her ring and put it back on, and this was just, a, you know, something she would do. Well, one day she came back and looked at the bedside table, no ring, and so she's like, oh, that's odd, so she's looking around, couldn't find it. Hey, honey, get in here. I, I can't find my wedding ring. What? <laughs> yeah. So we start looking through the house. I mean, we start tearing through the house. I mean, I'm lifting up the mattress. We're looking at, you know, pull every drawer is pulled open. I mean, we're like, we can't find it anywhere. And at the time, we had this amazing, beautiful, really fun, joyful puppy named Daisy. Uh, this is a picture of Daisy here. And we both looked over at Daisy, and she kind of gave one of those little golden retrievers, you know, head cocked, like, mm -hmm. You know, like, Rrr. and uh, Danny and I looked at each other and we thought, oh no, could she have eaten that ring? So we grabbed Daisy, put her in the car, drove down the vet. And I'm just thinking, this is the most expensive golden retriever in the entire world. <laughs> like we are driving this thing. <laughs> yeah. So we get to the vets and we're hanging out in the little reception office there. And uh, we hear some chuckling in the back. And uh, one of the vets says, you've got to come see this. So we walk in the back and on the x-ray table, we see this image. <laughs> well, they give us uh, some, some, you know, they give some medicine to her to try to get her to throw it up. So she throws it, she throws up, but, but nothing comes out. The ring doesn't come out. And we're like, uh-oh. So they send us home with some doggy x lax <laughs> And for the next few days, I sift through, and yes, it was me, who sifted through Daisy's Daisy. And I will never forget when I saw the outline of that ring in one of those little daisies. And I quickly grabbed it and kind of pulled it out and then ran inside, put it on Danielle's finger. I was like, there it is. No, no, no. No, no, no. I, I, I washed it. I sanitized it. And then I placed that ring uh, back on her finger. But Daisy, you can see, and Danny's here today. You can go find her, see her ring. That ring has traveled through uh, the, the intestines of a golden retriever. But Daisy saw something. She saw that ring. She saw something that looked good in her eyes. And she went for it. 
she went for it. And this describes what is happening in this book of Judges that, that we've been in. And this is what happened with Samson. Judges uh, is this story of how Israel sees what it, it looks good in their own eyes. Judges 17 says, every man did what was right in his own eyes. And so this nation of Israel that God had called out to be separate, to be holy, they would look around at surrounding nations and they would eventually kind of fall into what the surrounding nations were doing, worshiping idols and getting, uh, getting their eyes off of God. And then God in his wisdom and mercy would allow them to be you know, taken over by one of these nations until they would cry out again to God. And then God would raise up a judge to deliver them. And then they would get back right with God. But then eventually they would forget God and then look around and turn to idol worship and the whole cycle would continue. It's a very kind of depressing moment in Israel's history. And Samson is no different. God raises up Samson because the people of Israel are now taken over by the Philistines and Samson's raised up by God. And we're going to see Samson's life today. And it's going to get your seatbelt on because we are going through Samson's life. There's all kinds of crazy things that he's involved in and does. And this is not for the faint of heart. In fact, if you've got young kids in the room, it's like, oh, should you, should you hear some of this stuff? Like, this, I mean, it's filled with sex and violence and inappropriate language. And it's like, whoa, it's all here in the Bible. So just a little warning. If you kind of slip out with your younger kid, that's okay. I won't be offended. Uh, but we're going to go there because it's there in the scriptures. And it's the story of Samson's life, this incredible man of power. I mean, he's known around the world as being this sort of superhuman this Samson character. And yet, he's got such physical strength, but he's got such internal moral weakness. He's kind of an interesting character. He can't quite withstand the pressures all around him. He doesn't have the moral character to withstand it. He implodes throughout his life. And you'll see that happen as we walk through it. You're going to see it time and time again. Samson's weakness is on display. Samson's weakness is on display. And what we're going to learn today, the big thing that I want us walking away from today is your greatest strength is not found in you. Your greatest strength is found in your dependence on God. Your greatest strength. And Samson is going to show us that. And now we, we, we hear that your greatest strength is found in your dependence on God. Well, when we think of dependence, we think of limitation. We think of weakness. And in our culture, we do not like weakness. We like strength. We want our politicians to be strong. We want our Marvel superheroes to be strong. I mean, there's a reason why Top Gun just blew up, you know, every record in blockbuster history, because we want to see Tom Cruise be strong, even especially when his boss says he can't be, right? I mean, we just glorify strength in our culture. And yet, if we're all honest today, and you know, little bubbles popped up about around all of our heads, we would all have to admit, we've got glaring weaknesses. We've got weaknesses. We've got limitations. You know, we, we sometimes feel entitled, and we want, I want that thing now, whatever that thing is, fill in the blank. You know, sometimes we're prideful, and we're like, yeah, uh, you know, I'm something else, and we just start thinking too, you know, too much of ourselves. Uh, sometimes we compromise, and we allow a, a, just a little gossip into our life, and then that kind of grows, or we allow a little lust into our lives, and, and that kind of grows. We allow little things to happen in our life, and we allow sin to grow, and we compromise. And we've got weaknesses. We've got weaknesses. We always want to win the argument if we're really honest with ourselves. Now, all of us have weaknesses, and yet God isn't surprised by that. God knows your weakness. God knows my weakness. And he doesn't say, come on, get it together. God says, oh, that's okay. Bring your weakness to me. Bring your weakness to me because God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. Your greatest strength is not in you. It's in your dependence on God. So let me pray, and then let's dive into the life of Samson. God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that our weaknesses are not a surprise to you, that you don't push us away, but instead you actually draw close to us. You long for us to bring our weaknesses to you, that we would find true strength, not from us, but from depending and relying on you. So would you speak to us today? God, would you encourage our hearts to know that you're with us and you'll be our strength? And we pray this in your name. Everyone said together, amen. amen. Yeah, if you've got weakness in this place, you're in good company. You're in good company today. If you're feeling like, oh, I'm weak, I don't know if I can... Uh, you're in a great place. And today, as we look at Samson's life, you're going to be like, wow, 
I'm encouraged. So Judges chapter 14, we kick off with Samson's life. It says, Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, it said, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Well, Samson went down to Timnah. We start off, it's already going bad. Because some, of, you know, some things about Samson is he was given a Navarite, Nazarite vow from birth. God gave him this special vow. And Nazarite just comes from the word Nazir, just means to abstain or to, to be set apart and to be, and, you know, to be set apart, to be holy. Well, he got this Nazarite vow. And some abstentions with the Nazarite vow were you can't touch alcohol or anything from the grapevine. You can't touch a dead body or a carcass. And, uh, and you can't cut your hair. So you had to let your hair grow out. Those are the three things for the Nazarite vow. I mean, Samson's like set apart to be God's man. And so what do we got in the very introduction of his life? He went down to Timnah. Where was Timnah? It was this place of luxurious vineyards. I mean, Samson went to Na you know, Napa Valley, even though he's not supposed to drink wine. This is, the, this is the picture. And it's like, oh, my gosh, he, Samson went down to Timnah. Sounds like a country song. You know, <laughs> Things are not going to go well. And he's already breaking Nazarite vow number one. And he sees this young Philistine woman. He says to his fa father and mother, I've seen this Philistine woman. Get her for me as my wife. Here's another issue. <laughs> uh, you know, he sees this Philistine woman. God had set Israel apart to be a blessing to all nations through this one nation, that all nations would be blessed, but it would be this set-apart nation that would be different, unique from all the surrounding nations. And so he, that's why he commanded people not to intermarry and to do all that because then they would begin to lose their identity as God's unique chosen people to, that would be a blessing to all people. This isn't racial prejudice. This is God wanting to bless all nations, but he wants to do it through this one nation. So here's, you know, here's Samson going, no, 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 I don't know she's from a different, but you know what? That's okay. Get, she looks good in my eyes, so bring her to me. Uh, when my son was two, uh, he would, uh, if he wanted something, he would point his finger out and wiggle it and say, that one, that one, mama. <laughs> he said, I want that one. So whenever I think of Samson, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's, he's doing that. I want that one. And so the father and mother reply, you know, uh, you know, basically they try to convince him not to do this. But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. That same, that same free phrase in Hebrew is similar to, she looks right in my eyes. This looks right in my eyes. Sound familiar? So Samson went down to, to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. You'll see this time and time again where the spirit of God like rushes on to Samson and he's filled with supernatural strength. So we don't know, was Samson this giant hulk of a man or was he like this kind of like little man that just got supernatural strength when God would rush onto him? We don't know. I kind of imagine him big, but that's just me. And the strength comes on him in this part where he just rips this lion apart. It's like, whoa, okay, this is wild. Now, the Philistines were sometimes symbol symbolized uh, as a lion because of their intensity. So this might be some foreshadowing here of what you're going to see in a bit. <coughs> Samson rips this lion apart. Sometimes later, he went back to uh, marry this Philistine woman. He turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. And it was a swarm of bees and some honey, which he scooped out with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them, uh, gave them some, and they ate it too. So here we got Nazarite vow number two. You're not supposed to touch a dead body. You're not supposed to touch a carcass. What does Samson do? He goes and grabs the honey out of the carcass, and then he brings it. You know, when people are eating it, Samson just goes, eh, not that big of a deal. Now his father, verse 10, went down to see the woman, and Samson made a feast there as was customary for bridegrooms. When he appeared, he was given 30 companions. So Samson's throwing a big party in Timna, in the land of vineyards. I mean, it's just like he has no regard for what he's been called to, to be set apart here. Well, he says, let me tell you a riddle, Samson says to the group. If you can give the answer within the seven days of the feast, I'll give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. This is a lot of money. I'm going to give you 30 outfits, okay? Uh, and, and, and you got to just tell me the riddle. It's easy. Well, he says, if you can't give me the answer, you owe me 30 outfits, right? Well, they say, tell us your riddle. Let's hear it. And Samson says, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Well, we know he's talking about the lion. Well, for three days, they couldn't give the answer. So here, they go to Samson's wife, and they're like, all right, try to get it out of him. And if you don't get it out of him, we're going to kill you. 
So now Samson's wife is like, oh my gosh, she nags him and nags him for seven days, the whole days of the party. And by the final day, he's just like, I've had enough. You know, here's the answer. It was the lion, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, she basically goes to the guys and goes, I got the answer for you. And they go to Samson and they say, here's the answer. And they basically, you know, he, 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 from their response, he goes, oh my goodness, you talked with my wife, is what he says. And then we come to the weirdest passage, maybe in all of the Bible, at least top five, uh, where Samson says, if you had not plowed with my heifer, <laughs> wow, you would not have solved my riddle. So I don't know if that's like a free side note for the guys, like don't let anybody plow with your wife and definitely don't refer to her as a heifer. My goodness. <laughs> then the spirit came upon Samson in power. There it is again. The spirit rushes on him. And he went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of the men there, stripped them of their belongings and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he went to his father's house. So he goes, I, I owe these guys 30 outfits. What am I going to do? Goes to a surrounding uh, village there, kills 30 guys and brings the clothing. You know, and he's just like, here you go. So he gets using his power in all kinds of destructive ways. Burning with anger. It makes me think, I don't know if you've watched Dude Perfect, but Ty from Dude Perfect has these rage monster moments where he just goes nuts. And this is, this is what I think of when I think of Samson. Well, it says, later on at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat, went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room. Uh, it was customary that if, even if you married somebody at that time, they might stay with their parents for a season and this was the case here. But her father would not let him go in. I was so sure you thoroughly hated her that I gave her to your friend. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. I mean, this is like, wow, I, this is some dysfunctional stuff here. I mean, you could make like a, you know, you know real life t TV show based on this family here. This would be a, a major popular show. Take her instead, major dysfunction. And so Samson is so irate. He goes to no another rage state. And he does something wild. He grabs 300 foxes. We don't know how he gets these foxes or how long it takes him. It may have taken a month. But he gets these foxes, and then he ties them by their tails, two, two by two. Then he ties a torch onto the tail and lights it and sends the foxes into the nearby grain fields. And now we've got the grain all just burning up. I mean, this was really valuable to the people at that time. So Grain's burning up. Foxes are running everywhere. It's wild. I mean, th I, I've been a part of some pranks in my life that are good. This is next level pranking. <laughs> and so Samson does this. And the people are so angry. When the Philistines asked, who did this? They were told Samson, the Timnite son-in-law, because his wife was given to his friend. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. This is just, I'm telling you, I, I warned you. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously, slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Etom. So Samson, again, rage, kills a bunch of people, and is hiding in a rock. And then at this point, the people of the Philistines are just like, we're going to go destroy him and the people of Judah. And so the people of Judah apprehend the Philistines and go, hold on, we will bring Samson to you. Like, like, just don't, don't worry. We're going to get the source of it all here, and we're going to bring him to you. So they come to Samson, hiding in that cave, and they go, look, don't you realize the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done? They're so drifted. They're so forgotten. They're, they, they've so turned their eyes away from God, and now they're just used to their oppressor. They're more willing to kind of defend their oppressor then support their deliverer. They're just so warped in their mind. They've been enslaved for so long. Well, Samson says, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. <laughs> Very militarily uh, brilliant here, Samson. Agreed, they answered. We, we will only tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. There's that foreshadowing of the lion attacking him. The spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. There's the third time we see that happen. The ropes on his arms become like charred flax and the bindings drop from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey supernaturally empowered by the spirit of God. And then Samson's got this song that he sings or poem that he says, with a donkey's jawbone, I've made donkeys out of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I've killed a thousand 
men, literally with a ass is jawbone. I have made asses out of them. I mean, he's, he's, having, some, he's having some fun with wordplay. I've killed a thousand. Uh, when he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone. I mean, this is the ultimate mic drop. He's got the jawbone, you know, it's probably bloodied, and he just drops it, right? He's just like, check me out. This is Samson. And then we get to probably the most famous story of Samson's life that most of us, all of us have probably heard and is known around the world. Sometime later, Samson fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. It's interesting to me that Samson's name in Hebrew means son or sunny, and Delilah's name means delicate night. The Lila of that name is the root word for night. And so here we have the sun coming up against the night, and we see what happens next. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him. So we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. This is a ton of money, a ton of money, way more than five years' worth of wages. I mean, she's, it's like, here you go. It's a, a big price that she's offered. And so she takes it. She takes the money. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Well, he, he tricks her, and he gives her three things that are not true, okay? Three, three lies. He goes, look, you got to use, you know, you got to use this, this material, this, uh, this, this, the same material that they would use bow and arrows and have the bowstring. These bowstrings were usually made from animal intestines, super strong. And so she goes, oh, you, you, you got to use those, and you'll tie me up, and I'll lose my strength. So she tries that. <laughs> doesn't work. He goes, oh, well, you got to use unused ropes, brand new ropes, and that'll do it. So she does that. doesn't work. He goes, oh, well, well you, know, you, you got to take the braids of my hair and sort of weave them into a loom, and, and that'll really do it. So she tries that, and that doesn't work. So he's just, he's just having some fun here. But then she says to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he tired to death. It's a lot of nagging. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head because I've been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would have le left me and I'd become as weak as any other man. I don't know why Samson, of all the Nazarite vows, he's like, dead body? Eh, not that big of a deal. Alcohol? Eh, it's fine. You know, grow your hair out? That kind of sounds cool. Like, I, like, like in a death metal band or something? Like he liked long hair. I don't know why that was the thing that he stood to, but it was. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave the seven braids of his hair. And so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. You know, God is so patient with people. He's so patient with us. His, 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 his love, is, his mercy is quick, right? He's slow to anger, but he's so quick to offer love and offer forgiveness. And yet the scriptures also teach that God will not be mocked and that we reap what we sow. And I think at this point, God was just like, you know what? Enough. Like you've done too much, Samson. I've got to say no. He was merciful for so long. And here he says, no. You're not going to be able to do this. And his strength left him. And then Delilah called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep and he thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. I think it's the saddest line of the whole story. He didn't know. He didn't know that the Lord had left him. And that was his state. Well, then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison. Oh, this is where sin leads us. This is where sin led Samson. Uh, one uh, Baptist preacher said, sin will bind you and blind you and grind you. And I'm like, I said, you know, kind of corny, but I'm like, eh, I, I remember it. And this is what happened here with Samson. Uh, he's blind, he's bound, and now he's grinding grain. Uh, most likely the grain was used for the worship of Dagon, the god of grain. 
But here, the only time we ever see Samson worshiping is when he's forced to, against, maybe against his will. He's worshiping this God of Dagon, blind and bound. This is where his character, this is where his life ends. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Wow, even in the midst of the darkest dungeon, there's hope. There's hope. And that's the little glimmer of hope we get in the story. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, that god of grain, to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God's delivered our enemy. The one who laid waste our land has multiplied our slain, and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood among, they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I can lean on them. It's the only time we ever see Samson ask for help. It's right here with this, this servant. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there and on the roof. There were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. All the rulers were there. So the Philistines, it was made up of like five townships. And it was led by these rulers, these like gang leaders, if you will, these mafia right? The godfathers of these, of these. And they're all there together, all in one place. That's a very unique uh, moment in history, along with 3,000 men and women. So Samson prayed to the Lord, oh, sovereign Lord, remember me. Oh, God, please strengthen me just once more. Really the only time we see God, uh, Samson cry out for God is in, he's in this desperate place. And let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. And this is the end of his life. Now, for those of you who you know, really like a, a happy ending to a movie, I just, I'm so sorry. My father-in-law probably here. Uh, this is just not it. I mean, this is just depressing. Now, God uses him. God uses Samson to deliver Israel from the Philistines. That's amazing. But in terms of Samson, I mean, he's, he's dead. Doesn't even get to kind of celebrate the next season of Israel's life. He, he dies. And that's the ending of the story. Oh, what a ride that was, wasn't it? <laughs> And now, uh, uh, we've we got to ask some questions. What can we learn from Samson's life? Well, one, he had this great enemy. The greatest enemy that Samson had wasn't the Philistines. The greatest enemy that Samson had was himself. And it's the greatest enemy that you have. It's the enemy that's looking back at you when you look in the mirror. The weakness that you know you have. Samson had several weaknesses. Uh, he was entitled. He had like a give me, give me, give me attitude. Give me pleasure. Give me glory. Uh, give me power. Give me revenge. Uh, where are you at with that in terms of entitlement? Uh, do you want something and do you want it now? Uh, there was a famous experiment called the Marshmallow Experiment at Stanford where a psychologist, Dr. Walter Mischel, uh, had a study. He would put uh, kids in a room. He put a kid in a room with one single marshmallow. And he said, if you, if you, you can take the marshmallow if you want. It's one little reward. Uh, but if you wait just a little bit of time, uh, we're going to leave the room. And if you wait, uh, in a little while, we'll bring back a second marshmallow, and you can have that. And so these kids, you can see some of this on video uh, because other people have reenacted this experiment. It's, it's really funny what they do. I mean, some kids will pick up the marshmallow and yeah, kind of bite it a little bit and then put it back. And one kid just grabbed it, ate it right away, just like, forget this. I want this now. Uh, and, then they, and then they would come in about 15 minutes later, and, you know, and then they'd give the two marshmallows for those that waited. Uh, it was funny, one of the kids grabs both of them, puts both in his mouth. He's like, yes, you know, <laughs> victory. And, and what they found as they tracked the lives of these kids is that at, throughout their lives, they had, they had better SAT scores, the ones who waited. They had better academic achievements, uh, even better body mass index, like their bodies physically were developed differently. And then 20 years later, they went and studied these people. Where are they now? Uh, and they had greater relational harmony. They had uh, greater achievements in their lives in terms of financial achievement, success. And you look at their lives, it's like, whoa. And, and so the, the, the team there discovered, you know, the one thing that made their lives different was the fact that they were able to say, I can wait. 
So here's this entitlement thing that Samson has. I want it now. I want to ask you where, in this room, is there something in your life where you're like, I need this now? You know, whether it's a relationship that, you know, isn't not, not quite God's best, but man, I want it. I deserve this, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever it might be that you're tempted to think, I need this now. And I know it's not what God would want, but uh, I deserve it. Is there an entitlement that's kind of maybe crept in? Uh, Samson had other weaknesses. It wasn't just entitlement, but compromise. You know, just allowing a little bit of sin, a little bit of, eh, this wasn't, it's not that bad. And he would allow it into his life. And that compromise led to all kinds of destruction. And that can happen in our lives, right? We're all weak in different ways. And maybe some of us have allowed a little bit, of, a little bit in, like a, a little bit of gossip here. You know, a little bit of lust is okay. A little bit of porn is okay. I can, you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, people around the world, it's relativism. It's follow your heart. It's do what feels right to you. It's do what feels right in your own eyes. Sound familiar? <laughs> this is our culture. And yet God's like, wait, wait, wait. There's a way to live. There's a way to live that would bring you life and blessing. And yet some of us get tripped up and we allow that into our lives. Uh, my, my family had a little leak in the bathroom, in our guest bathroom. We didn't know it was there. It was underneath. And uh, later we found out it had destroyed underneath. It destroyed the subfloor. The, 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 the joists down there were rotten. And that's what sin does. You know, the, the, the Bible talks about sin uh, being about, the Bible talks about Satan being like a, uh, a, a roaring lion ready to devour us wants to steal, kill, and destroy from us. But sometimes I think we treat that enemy like a little puppy. We're just like, oh, it's okay. And we allow it in. But it can destroy our whole lives. The foundation of our lives can just be ruined because of that little stuff that we let in. And then it grows, especially when it's unseen and we don't confess it. And, you know, just got to ask us here in this room. If you're here and you're like, yeah, I've kind of let some of that in. And God's saying, hey, get that out into the light. Confess that so that you can experience freedom and forgiveness. Well, you know, Samson also had pride. He had pride. He just, he was like, I can do it myself. I don't need any help. And he was really, a lot of the times he's like, I want the glory. I think that's what drove him. And so got to ask us here and ask myself here, you know, is there any area of our lives where it's like, I don't need anybody? You know, do you have people in your life that you invite to, to encourage you or give you critique or tell you when you're out of line and go, hey, it doesn't seem right? Or are you like, no, I got it on my own? And are you leveraging your gifts that God's given you for, for, for God or for your own glory? This is what pride does to us. And we all can fall prey to it uh, in different ways. Entitlement, compromise, pride, lots of other things. But we all have our struggle. We all have our shadow side. We all have it in this room. If we're, if we're honest, even those of us who are just here, we're exploring this. We're like, I don't know about this Jesus stuff, you know, but, but we can all admit, you know, as human beings, we're imperfect. We've got weakness. And yet what Samson's life shows us is that even though we've got weakness, God says, bring that to me. Let my strength be given to you. Let, let, your, let your weakness be given to God that his strength would be made perfect through you. God says, bring on your weakness. The more we bring that on to him, he just fills us with all the more strength. You know, scientists have studied uh, and found this interesting fish called the snailfish that has the ability to live 8,000 meters below the ocean surface. I mean, literally over five miles below the ocean surface. And they discovered it down there. Like, how can this thing survive? It's this weird looking long fish. It's translucent. It's got little eyes. And it's just, they're, they're you know, mesmerized by this little thing. And as they researched it and looked into it, they realized this snailfish lacked something really important. And it was the swim bladder. It's the thing that allows you to, you know, most fish, almost all fish have this. Uh, and it, it allows them to equalize the pressure. They, they could be buoyant. The snailfish doesn't have that. So what allows this snailfish to survive way under there with all the pressure is its limitation. It's what it's lacking. Literally, it's the weakness of the snailfish. <laughs> that allows it to survive under all that pressure. And it's the weakness that you have and I have when we give it to God and we say we're dependent on you. That's what will allow us to survive and live a victorious life after Jesus, even though we've got all this pressure around us and we realize our weakness. We go, Lord, I'm going to give it to you. And we find our greatest strength, 
our greatest strength is not in us. It's in our limitations. It's in our dependency on God. Your greatest strength is in your dependency on God. Well, about a thousand years after the angel came and visited Samson's mom and dad and said, you're going to have a miraculous child. I know you're barren, but through your husband, we're going to do this, and you're going to have a miraculous child named Samson, and he's going to be set apart. Well, another angel came to a teenage girl named Mary and said, you're going to have a miraculous child. He's going to be set apart. Well, the first angel with Samson said, you know, God's going to use this guy to begin to deliver Israel from their enemies. Well, the angel that appeared to Mary said, God's going to use this son of yours to deliver people from their sin. Well, Samson and Jesus have supernatural ability. Samson can destroy lions. Jesus can destroy demons and eventually destroy death itself. Samson and Jesus were both betrayed by someone that was close to them. Samson and Jesus were both beaten and, and tortured. You know, Samson, against his will, was, was eventually tortured, beaten, mocked, jeered. Jesus willingly gave his life, mocked, tortured, jeered. Jesus willingly laid his life on the cross and even while on the cross said, God, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Both Samson and Jesus died with their arms stretched wide, but Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He rose again on the third day. He took all of our weakness, all of our sin onto himself. And then he conquered that sin by dying, by dying our death, and then conquering sin and death by rising again from the dead. And now he offers his life, his strength to any of anybody who would say yes to Jesus, who would say, I give up. I recognize my weakness. I recognize my sin. And I trust you that you can take that, that you paid for that. And I give you my life and I receive your life instead. And you get the Holy Spirit in you that won't just rush on you on occasion, but will be with you at all times to help you overcome the weakness in your life. God, thank you for this incredible story. Thank you that your, your, your word, your scriptures are not filled with perfect people uh, that we can never measure up to. But God, your word is filled with flawed, imperfect, weak people that, that, that we could relate to and go, yeah, that, that's me. Entitlement, I want it now. Yeah, that's me. Compromising, saying yes to things that aren't really, would be best or not doing the things I know I should. That's me. Pride, just, I want the, I don't need anyone to help me. And, and to, if I'm honest, I kind of want the glory to be mine alone. Uh, that's me. Lord, there's so many things that we're weak in, and God, you're not at, at the slightest uh, uh, surprised by it. You know all of it. And God, thank you that even in our sin, while we were still sinners, you died for us. You took all of that on yourself. You died the death we deserve. And God, you paid the price that we could never pay. God, thank you that you defeated death and that you rose again, that you offer your very spirit for anyone who would trust you, anyone who would give their life to you. And so, Lord, today we trust you. In a fresh way, we say yes to you, Lord. We give you our weakness, God. And thank you that your strength is made perfect in it. God, for those who are here and they're just not sure about uh, faith or about you, uh, we just ask that you would uh, point their hearts, Lord, that you would open their hearts, open the eyes of their hearts, that they could see you for who you are, that you love them, that your strength is available for them, your deliverance is available. And even these next moments, Lord, we ask that, uh, that people would cry out to you. And thank you that when we cry out, you rush in to deliver us. We love you, God. Thank you for this passage. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for your strength. We pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and stand to our feet.